All right, if there's nothing more, then let's stand and we'll read the text from 1 John 4, 7 through 21. <clears throat> Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this is the commandment that we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this testimony of John and these words of Scripture that help us to understand the primal place that love has in the heart of a Christian. So we pray, Lord, that as we speak your word today, that you would place that love in our hearts in a fresh and new way, and that we could sense that we have been touched by you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> I was uh, speaking about how um, deeply we feel the loss of those that we have loved. It's part of the price that we pay for having loved. But one of the things that Kay and I experienced when we first came to Shaw is, and I believe this is true, it's one of the testimonies that we had when we were living here homeless the first year and couldn't leave and it was like we couldn't leave because the spirit wouldn't allow us to leave but but what we were experiencing was we were experiencing the love of god through the people of the community it was so ab obvious it was so absolutely true people loved us and had no reason to they didn't know us you know and yet we could tell that they loved us deeply that they cared about us people like betty gilson for example she really cared about us. She wanted us to stay on Shaw, and she wanted us to have a place. And um, she and Judy worked on it until we had a place, you know. But, but it was many others. And um, <clears throat> because of it, of course, we came to love them, the people on Shaw. And one of the prices that you pay for having cared deeply and loved people deeply is that you miss them terribly when they go. It's a sense of loss that's hard to explain. It's, you know, we talk about the stages of grief and the different things that people go through, but that's the price of having loved deeply. And that's really what love is. Love is caring very deeply. It's a genuine, heartfelt, deep care for someone. And it's more than that. It's a willing the very best for them. Wanting the very best for them. And... Um, and not just wanting it, but willing it. Being willing to sacrifice for it if necessary. Sacrifice your very life. And that's the heart of this passage of Scripture. The Apostle John had the testimony in other writings that are not in Scripture of a per, uh, being a person who loved very deeply. He was, um, it was the thing that marked his life. I'm not sure if it's in the Didache or it's one of the early church writings that... Uh, 
that gives testimonies of the way he loved people to an extreme. It was just absolutely unbelievable. But it was like supernatural love that characterized the life of the Apostle John. No wonder he writes so much about it in his epistle. But um, basically his argument is this. It's very simple. God loves us, and he loves us even when we are unlovely. Not only that, but he is willing to sacrificially love us. And that's what the Ethiopian eunuch was reading, about the sacrifice that God made because he loved us. He cared about us so deeply that he was willing to give his own life, to sacrifice himself. And, um, and that not only did he sacrifice himself for us and loved us in that way, but he made it possible that his spirit, that very spirit of love, sacrificial love, can come and live inside of us. And one of John's, uh, one of the outstanding scriptures that uh, John wrote had to do with Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. He said anyone who denies that Jesus Christ came literally in the flesh, he said, is, a, is a antichrist. And um, because that's very important. It's, it's important not only for the fact that he was human, which he needed to be because the high priest is taken from among the people. He has to be one of us. How can he intercede for us if he's not one of us? So he had to become one of us. But more than that, he lives in us who are literally human beings. He comes into our flesh, as it were. And he lives in us. And that's the heart of Christianity. We cannot love the way God calls us to love if Jesus isn't living inside of us. And that's his whole argument here. God loved us. He sacrificed himself for us. He abides in us. He has given us that spirit of love. That's, and he says, and that is your major um, basis for assurance of salvation, is that you now have a deep care for someone that you didn't have before. You have this mark of God's spirit in you, is that you love people. And if you don't, then how can you say that you're born of God? Because the very Spirit of God, that's what he's like. And he's given you that Spirit. He lives inside of you. It's a sacrificial love for people that's willing to sacrifice for their well-being. Lay down your own life and, and um, do whatever's necessary so that they can be blessed and they can have what they need. And it's very important that we are wise about doing that. The Bible makes it very clear. One of, the, um, one of the issues in today's culture is that people try to keep the second commandment, which is loving your brothers yourself without keeping the first. Loving God is loving truth. It's loving righteousness. It's loving holiness. It's loving everything that there is about God. It's loving justice. The Bible's very clear. There's many passages of Scripture like that. And that overarches the second commandment, which is equally important to love our brother as ourself, but it's loving them through that grid of loving God and loving what's best for them. And sometimes that's why there are books that are written called Tough Love and things like that. It's or speaking the love in and speaking the truth in love, you know. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is tell somebody the truth. You know? Maybe you're the only person who can do it. But speak the truth to them, but speak it in a way that's coming out of a deep care, that they can feel it, that they know it, that you care about them. And that's why you are speaking the truth to them. So, um, so this thing about loving can get very complex in a sense, and it's not possible to do it outside of the spirit of Christ. We can't have that supernatural, sacrificial love without having Christ living inside of us. And Jesus made it very clear that being our friends, I mean, you know, when somebody's being loving to us, a husband or a wife is being loving to us, it's easy to love them back. But uh, when someone is, is uh, an enemy, someone who's out to get us, to love them, that's the challenge. Jesus said that's when it really the rubber meets the road, you know. That's when true love is really evident, is when you can love your enemies. You can bless those that curse you. You can pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. That's really that sacrificial love coming through. 
you know, that nobody can make us hate them. You know, I, um, I really admire my uh, younger brother. He's a bishop of a very large Mennonite church and has done a lot of mission work over in Romania. And, and when they first went to Romania, there were a lot of um, barriers to their uh, being able to buy a house and just all the things that they needed to do. And one of them was to own a vehicle. They had to have a national, have their name on the title. And so he trusted someone, put his name on the title of the vehicle, and the guy ended up taking it. And um, so when it happened, he uh, had to give him the car. And he... And the guy, of course, was doing it on purpose. And so he went up to the window. The guy was already in the car. And he said, um, said you know, you can, you can do a lot of things. He said, you can take my car. You can make it rough for me. You know. But he said, one thing you can't do. He said, you can't make me hate you. He said, I'll always love you and care about you. Well, that's a tremendous testimony to me of my brother Joe. And that's what's in his heart. I believe that's how he felt. And that comes from having the love of God in you and living in it, practicing it. You know, it doesn't happen one in one day. Because the way I picture it is like this. You know, uh, Jesus said that spiritual life is like a seed. Well, we all know what a seed is. It has a germ of life in it. The outside of the seed is not impressive. The outside of the seed we call the husk. And the challenge for all of us is to break through the husk, to let the love show, to let it grow. And all of us are sort of going through that process, you know, where this love is in us, and we have to let it out. We have to cultivate it, and, and, uh, but God is part of that process as well. But, um, but the hard part is to love someone through the husk, you know, when what you see from them is the husk. And could be, the love of God can be in there, but um, but when it's hidden, you know that's that's really difficult. And um, I'm going to um, to read a passage of scripture today. I'm not really following my notes very well here, but um, from Ephesians five, <clears throat> because this really um, this really is where it starts. It starts with uh, with one's family, with one's loved ones, and uh, goes out from there. I mean, if we can't, like the scripture we read said, if you can't love those you see, you know, how can you love God whom you can't see? If you can't love the ones you see, the ones who are close to you, how in the world are you going to love people who are your enemies or who are um, in Nepal or wherever? But um, so this is talking about family relationships. Let's uh, think about that for a little bit. Re Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ. By the way, last Sunday we were talking about abiding in Christ, and I have no idea how we got to this uh, part of the subject, but we're talking about the wife being the weaker vessel. Sometimes a wife, because of the fact that she is a weaker vessel, compensates for it by sharpening her tongue, you know, for a husband to keep on loving his wife when she has a sharp tongue, just remember that's the husk. You love her through it. I mean, sometimes that's the only power they have, you know. And it, so, but anyway, uh, to love your wife through it. And I said, you know, I've got this project that I'm doing before Kay comes home. I just wanted you to know that I got it done. And it really paid off. Because what this scripture is saying is that there are some forms of love that are so powerful that they're almost selfishness. It ends up by saying, a man who loves his wife loves himself. You know, I understand that we are one, and it's talking about that too. But it's just a smart thing to do for a man to love his wife. That's a smart thing to do, and it's really a, doing himself a favor, you know. And um, so it's almost like a form of selfishness, but... That doesn't just apply to a man loving his wife. It applies to a wife loving her husband. It applies to children loving their parents, children loving each other. It applies to family loving each other, in-laws and brothers and sisters. And, you know, that's, that's love is what creates 
heaven on earth. I mean, that's the kingdom of God. Love is the kingdom of God. It's certainly a powerful aspect of it. And the more we do it, the more we will experience it. And it doesn't matter what our relationships are. It always pays. And But that's what I want to um, present to you today, because I can't convince you of this. I can't convince you that love is absolutely one of the most important things that a person can do, and even for yourself. Only God can do that, and life can do it. One of my deepest regrets is that I learned it so late in life, you know. But love absolutely works. It is powerful. It is wonderful. It is the most, one of the most important things in life. And, um, and it always is appropriate, you know. It's like it's never inappropriate. So, um, so just let it sink in. Allow, pray about it. Ask God about it. Ask God to break you out of that husk, you know, where love can really uh, be shown from your life and bless you because of it. But let me finish reading this. <clears throat> Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body. of His. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Uh, the reason I chose to, to read this is because the Apostle Paul is saying exactly the same thing that John is saying in his epistle. That this is the fruit of God's Spirit coming into our life. This is the fruit of God loving us. It's about Jesus loving the church, you know, and that's what he's saying is, that's the primary thing I'm saying in all of this. Husbands love your wives, that's Christ loving the church and giving himself for it, sacrificially laying down his life for it. And that's the spirit that comes into us when we become a Christian. And if we're not living it out, then it's still encased in that husk of the, it's just the germ of it is there. And that needs to break out, needs to grow. We need to cultivate it. You know, it's like um, we are workers together with God in this. And it's not just up to us because he's the one who makes it happen. You all know that when you cultivate your garden, only God can make it grow. You can't make it grow. He does that. He does his part, but we do our part. We cultivate it. And um, so I would just encourage you to um, start at home, but let your love go out to wherever God would have it to go. You know, care about people, care about things, and, and let your heart go out because it's really what it's about. It's about what's down in your heart and coming out. But, um, but this is such a, um, such a unique passage. Uh, Paul, I mean, John says, love is identified not by the fact that we love God, but the fact that he loves us. In other words, it starts with him. And, um, and that's true in the home. It starts with the husband. It starts with the father. That is absolutely where the burden of responsibility rests for having love in the home. If fathers don't love their wives and their children, um, how in the world are is it supposed to um, grow and develop? But even if that weren't true, it starts with the person who's loving. I mean, all of us have the responsibility. But Scripture, to follow the pattern of God, which is in Scripture, is that he loves us first, and he loves us even when we don't deserve it. It's a choice that he makes. It says that he loved us even when we were yet sinners. Christ loved us in in uh, Romans chapter 5. 
and gave his life for us, laid his life down for us. So it's not about deserving it or earning it. It's about a choice that we as men make. And, and I think it comes to each one of us, it's like that as well. It's a choice that we make. And we have to come to a decision. It, does this really work? Is this really the way I want to live? Is this really important to me? And make the decision, you know, this is how I'm going to live. I feel like Joshua myself, you know, when I say, as for me and my house, this is the way we're going to live. This is the way I'm going to live. And I will miss it, I know that. But that's my heart. That's the intention I have. Is that's how I'm going to live, no matter what. And um, by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's the way it's going to be. So, it's faith. You know, it's like believing God. It's believing the scriptures and and believing in the whole process of love and and um, um, all that. <clears throat> One of the um, things that came to me as I was meditating on this passage is the importance of maintaining a heart that is tender. Um, what tends to happen, what wants to happen, is if love is not returned or it's uh, challenged, is for us to protect our hearts by becoming callous and indifferent and hard-hearted. And the Bible warns against this continually. And I'll tell you something about that that I discovered a number of years ago that has been a tremendous help to me. And that is that when you close your heart against a person, you're also closing your heart against God. Because the very, it's the very same avenue that you interact with people is also the same avenue that you interact with God. So when you're closing off your heart, your heart is closed. And it's closed to God as well as it is to people. Don't do it. Allow your heart to be hurt if necessary, but keep it tender. Keep it open. Always uh, never allow, like Joe said, you know, you can't make me hate you. What he's really saying is my heart's always going to be open, you know. It's the way I live. It's the way I choose to live. It has nothing to do with you. That's my choice. You can't make me have a hard heart. Nor can anyone else make you have a hard heart. It's a choice that we make. Either we're going to stay vulnerable and soft and tender, or we'll get hard-hearted, and it's our own choice. But God is the one who helps us, of course. But I think this is very, very important. So it's um, cultivating your garden of love. I'd like to um, close with a scripture in Colossians. <clears throat> There's just, of course, so much in scripture about uh, about this subject, you could go almost anywhere, but Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. And this is just sort of jumping in in a long um, passage of Scripture, but it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. In other words, you are sanctified by the Spirit of God, and you are loved by God. And, you know, that's, that's just such an important aspect of loving. How can we love if we don't accept the love of God? You know, that we are loved by God. That's um, God abiding in us. You know, that we are loved by God. We are accepted by him. He has come and made his home in us. And he loves us. Um, so we are holy and beloved. Put on, says, tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. So, doesn't that make sense? You know, if Jesus forgives me and loves me the way he does, shouldn't I forgive others and love them? You know, that's, it just makes sense. I mean, if that spirit is living inside me, that's how I, it's one of the evidences that the spirit is living in me. So um, 
bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So, it's a comprehensive scripture, it's a comprehensive life. It's not simple. But it is possible, Spirit of God living in us, and that's the message of the gospel. You know, the uh, story of the Ethiopian eunuch <clears throat> is really quite amazing. Philip goes running up to the chariot. The eunuch is reading the story about God's sacrificial love for us. And he believes it and is baptized. The Spirit catches Philip away. The Ethiopian eunuch goes on his way rejoicing. Why is he rejoicing? Because his heart has received the love of God. His heart has received the message. It's like he knows that he is loved. He knows that God is with him. And so he goes home. He doesn't have the New Testament. We talked about that last Sunday. And I believe it's the beginning of the great Coptic church in the country of Ethiopia. And all he had was he had this experience that Philip came and baptized him and told him about the love of God and explained the scripture to him and he was converted and the Spirit of God came and lived inside of him. So what a powerful uh, testimony that is and a challenge to each one of us to allow that to um, mark our lives as well. I don't know what you base the assurance of your salvation on. There are a number of things that scripture gives us. One of them is simply the word of God that you believe it. But this is another one. If God's love lives in your heart, then you can have strong assurance, you know. And um, there are others as well, but those are the most important. <clears throat> Let's stand together for prayer.